Hi, welcome to the second set of lectures on concurrency in CS537 operating systems for the spring of 2013. Our topic today is semaphores. What you should learn is the difference between the synchronization capabilities provided by locks and what semaphores can do, and second, to identify the appropriate use of semaphores as compared to locks in either code or story problems, and third, to learn about their basic operations and how to initialize them. So let's first look at the motivation for semaphores. Why do we need semaphores if we have these things like locks that seem to work so well? The problem is that locks only provide one kind of operation, which is mutual exclusion. They make sure that only one thread executes holding the lock at a time, for example, a lock protecting a critical section. This is very useful for things like making sure your bank balance gets updated, but doesn't solve all the problems we might want to solve. For example, another thing we really want to do is to place an ordering on how threads get scheduled, meaning we want some code in one thread to be guaranteed to run before thread another code. A standard example of this is the producer-consumer problem we've talked about many times this semester. In this example, a producer creates a resource or some kind of data, and the consumer then consumes that resource. A simple example of this is pipelines on the Unix command line. Suppose if the pipeline show with the ps command, the grep command, and the wc command. In this case, the ps command produces output, and the grep command needs to wait for ps to produce it before it can consume that output. Similarly, the wc command has to wait for grep to produce output before it can run. So here we have an ordering problem where we need one program to run after the program. Typically in this problem, um, we don't want producers to consumers and consumers to run in lockstep. For example, we don't want to say let ps run for one line of output, then run grep for one line of output, then wc for one line of output, because this causes a lot of context switching and is therefore inefficient. Instead, we'd like to put a fixed size buffer between the producer and the consumer. This allows the producer to run as long as the buffer is in full, it can keep on adding data. The consumer can run pulling data out of the buffer as long as it is, isn't empty. This means that we now have a no, new kind of ordering problem where we, do, we still need to have threads that can sort of wait for each other to run. The producer waits if the buffer is full and the consumer waits if the buffer is empty. So let's look now at what semaphores are and then we'll learn how they can solve this problem. So a semaphore is really a higher level synchronization primitive than locks. It's often built using locks and it was invented by Edgar Dijkstra around 1965 as part of the THE operating systems project. A semaphore internally is a counter that has some special operations on it, a signal operation and a wait operation. Let's start with wait first. On the wait operation, the counter is decremented. If the counter is zero, then the wait operation will block until another thread signals the semaphore. So this is, uh, says this is how you wait for things to happen is by calling wait on a semaphore. This is also called P origin, in the original version, which is for the Dutch word for test because Dijkstra lived in the Netherlands. And it's also called down in some implementations. The second operation on semaphore is signal, which increments the counter. And if any threads are waiting, it wakes one up. This is also called V after the Dutch word for increment and also called up. The third operation is the initialization function, something like seminit, which takes a semaphore and sets the initial counter value. We'll see later on why this is an important thing to be able to do. So let's look now at the implementation. This is pseudocode for the algorithm inside of a semaphore. It's not actually the real code for a semaphore though. So first of all, we have to have a structure that has a value, which is what gets counted up and down, and then it needs a queue for the list of processes because we need to keep track of which processes are waiting so they can be woken up later. The wait function is exactly what I said. If the value of the semaphore is greater than zero, it decrements the value and returns. Otherwise, it adds the process to the list and blocks until somebody wakes it up. The signal function checks to see if the list is empty. Um, if it's not empty, then signal will remove a process from the list and wake it up. Otherwise, it increments the value. One thing to note is both the wait and the signal operations are critical sections because they access shared state, the access the, access the value and the access the queue. Therefore, these have to be executed atomically with respect to each other and are usually implemented using spin locks. Semaphores are blocking operations. They're blocking because threads that are, that are waiting for a semaphore aren't spinning like the locks that we saw before, but they're blocking. They wait on a queue instead, releasing the CPU for another thread or process to use. So when wait is called by a thread, if the semaphore is available, which means the count is one or greater, the value is one or greater, the thread continues. If the semaphore is unavailable, then the thread blocks waits in the queue and gives the CPU up to another thread or process. Calling signal sort of opens the semaphore. If a thread is waiting on the queue, then exactly one thread is unblocked. 
um, and it's put on the ready queue and can start running whenever the scheduler says it can run. If no threads are in the queue, then the signal is remembered for the next time a wait is called. This is done by incrementing the value. This means if there's a signal and there's no thread waiting, the next thread that calls wait may be able to run without wait without having to block first because that signal is remembered. So let's look now at how to initialize semaphores. So as we said, you can initialize it to different values, and I'd like to we'll talk about what those different values mean. So suppose we initialize the semaphore to one. What does that mean? Well, the first thread that calls wait will go right through without waiting, and the semaphore value will go from one to zero. If a second thread calls wait though, it will block because the value is one. The semaphore value stays at zero, but the thread goes on the queue. If the first thread then calls signal, the semaphore value stays at zero, but it wakes up the second thread, and the second thread returns from wait. If the second thread now calls signal, remember the value was zero, the value will now go from zero to one. Um, this means that the next caller to wait will not wait because the value is one. This may look like a very familiar pattern of synchronization that we've seen before, and the fact is that it's basically a mutex lock. If you initialize a semaphore value to one, and every thread has a set of paired calls to wait followed by a value to signal, then a semaphore acts just like a lock. This is useful because if you need locks in your system, a semaphore is one way to do it. So what happens if we initialize a semaphore value to two? Here's the code for semaphores to remind you what they do. So if we call seminit sem comma two, what happens when multiple threads now call wait? Well, when the first thread calls wait, the semaphore value will go from two to one, but the thread will continue. When the second thread calls wait, the value will go from one to zero, and it will continue too. It's only when the third thread calls wait that the semaphore value stays at zero and the third thread blocks. What this means is that if you initialize the semaphore to some value greater than zero, this indicates how many threads can call wait without actually waiting. Or you can think about this as the number of threads that can hold the semaphore at once. Um, in this case, we had two threads that could sort of hold the semaphore at once. So in general, the use of having a semaphore value is for allocating a number of resources. Suppose, for example, we have a number of shared buffers that different threads can use. Every time a thread allocates a shared buffer, it can call wait to wait until a shared buffer is available. This will decrement the count of available shared buffers stored by the semaphore. When a thread calls signal, it'll indicate a shared buffer is available, and one of the threads that's waiting can wake up and use it. This also may be useful in a system that has multiple devices that can be used by one thread at a time. This is the end of Unit 1 on semaphores. Please take the first quiz on semaphores before watching the next lecture.